So where are we? And why are we in Isaiah? Well, as we've already heard, today marks the start of this wonderful season of Advent. We begin the journey to the manger once again, a journey that perhaps we are all too familiar with. But Advent is the time to stop and focus and think about what, is, what it means when God comes as Emmanuel, God with us. It's also a new church year, so happy new year. The church year begins on Advent Sunday, having spent the, last, the best part of the last six months exploring the story of the people of God. We now start our new year today and spend the next six months looking at the story of God himself. It's a cyclical cycle of the church year. We go through Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, and then we start going back on our journey towards Christmas through an endless season of what is called ordinary time. The rhythm of the church year begins once again. The rhythm of the world picks up once again as we start hurtling towards Christmas. Perhaps you've been bombarded with Christmas in the shops since probably August. We've heard Christmas music in the shops since November. I learned this week there's such a thing as Whamageddon, where apparently you're supposed to get as far through December as you can without hearing Last Christmas by Wham. Well, I was out yesterday because I played it yesterday and I didn't even know. And I need to confess to you all this morning, I did have a mince pie back in October. <laughs> I normally leave it until Advent. They were reduced in the co-op. <laughs> That's my excuse. The season of Advent, friends, is a time of looking back. It's a time of reflection. But it's also a time of hope and anticipation. It is both and It's not quite as penitential as Lent when we say how bad we all are, that we're made from the dust and to dust we shall return. It's not quite that bad, but it is a time to think about everything that has happened in the past year and start to focus on where we might be going in the next year. You might remember if you were here at the start of 2023... I asked you, and I encouraged you during our nights of prayer, and then on the Sunday, if you weren't at them, to write down on a piece of paper three hopes or expectations that you had for this year, and three hopes that what you thought, I think it was the question, was something about what is God going to do for you this year? I sealed them and put them in the safe. Here they are. I'm going to return these to you today. I have not looked at them. They are still sealed. Each envelope in here is sealed. I'm going to put them at the back. I want to encourage you. Take it with you. Open it and see what's happened this year, whether it has or whether it hasn't. If you weren't here, don't worry. Just think back to what has happened this year, where your life is now. It may be in a very different place, and it probably is, to where you thought it would be when we did this back in January. And I'm going to be honest with you, I can't remember what I wrote in mine either, so it's as much a surprise for me as it probably is for you. It's important now, because it gives us a chance to review our hopes and expectations for 2023, and as the calendar year starts to draw to a close, it enables us to look with hope and anticipation at what is to come. So the reading from Isaiah we had, in many ways, is a bit taken out of context. We're very good at that in the church. We take scripture out of context, and so we don't actually know what goes before or what goes after it. It's not, it's not, it's not how it was originally penned. It's a false verse type. 64 is a false verse introduction that editors have put in. It's actually in the middle of a section of Isaiah where he is in prayer. It is part of a bigger prayer. And this particular section is where we get the idea about grieving or hurting God's Holy Spirit comes from, which Paul refers to in Ephesians 4. But it's a passage that is important because it reminds us that God's Holy Spirit was active in Israel at the time. We know that throughout our lives, throughout the history of the church, the Holy Spirit is active But we also know that there are times when the Holy Spirit is dormant. 
So when we take the whole of the prayer of Isaiah together, and I encourage you this afternoon, read the, read the bit before the start of 64 and read verse 10 onwards to get a full understanding of what it's like. But when we take the whole prayer together, it starts to read a bit like a psalm. It recalls God's past acts when he worked in, with mighty thunder, mighty fire fell down. It recalls the past acts just like the psalm starts. God, you are so good, unless it's a psalm of lament. It reminds the readers and the listeners, as it would have been in the, in the, in the ancient days, of the, 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 um, when God got involved in Israel. It reminds them that God's spirit was active and God got involved with the very people of Israel. And it reminds them about the responsiveness of the Israelites. Why is God not showing that concern or commitment expected of a father now is really what the prayer is getting at. God, where are you? Why are you not showing us what you need to do, what you aren't going to do? We're in a place where they've just returned from exile. Jerusalem is in desolation. There's despair, there's despondency. The historic family, Abraham, Jacob, Israel, would hardly be recognized now. But then, all is not lost. Because when we get to verse 8, we see an appeal to God as Father. Yet, Lord, you are our Father. And it's actually quite rare in the Old Testament to see God referred to as Father. There is also a moment of acknowledgement from the Israelites that they have been sinful. Verse 9, do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Now, when this was being written, we have to remember it was a time when sacrifices were made for sins. It was before Jesus had taken the sins of the world on the cross. And there is an almost a sense of them blaming God for their wandering, but they're not quite going that far. But you can sort of read it between the text. That actually the Israelites are saying, look, if you would have acted, God, we wouldn't have gone into exile. If you would have acted, things would be fine now. There wouldn't be this despair and this despondency. So what does all that mean for us in the here and the now? In December 2023, as we begin our journey to the manger once again, Is there despair? Is there despondency? Is there crying out, God, why are you not acting? God, we've been praying for revival for so long, yet we've not seen it yet. God, we want to see your Holy Spirit at work, but we come to church, we feel flat, we go home, we still feel flat. We've not engaged with the Holy Spirit. Our Our Bible study feels like a chore. It doesn't feel like we're getting anything from it. Perhaps that's how we are feeling today. But we're in good company, if you are. You're in good company. Because that's how the Israelites were feeling. And it is okay to feel that despair and the despondency. I wonder, when you open this envelope, if you'll be happy that your hopes were realized. Perhaps you're anticipating opening it with great excitement. Because you know they've been realized. Perhaps you're thinking about opening and thinking, mm, it might not have happened. What if it's not happened? Will that, how will I respond? What are you anticipating at the moment? Because that anticipation can be good or bad. Perhaps we're anticipating that moment on Christmas morning when the child opens the present they've been asking us for since July. Perhaps you're anticipating catching up with family and looking forward to seeing them again. And it'd be really lovely to perhaps catch up in person rather than on a phone call. Although perhaps we're anticipating that it's actually not going to be like that. It's not going to be like it is on TV where everybody sits around a huge table with a massive turkey that's perfectly cooked and that everybody is all smiles and laughter and there is no uh, tension whatsoever. Wouldn't that be great if we could say that's actually what happens? Because let's be honest, friends, it, that, it, it's not. Perhaps we're anticipating a difficult phone call or a response to a letter. What we see in Isaiah, though, is that God's people have wandered. It's led them to exile, and now as they return, they see that desolation and destruction that's been left. 
We often get excited as we celebrate Advent. I certainly do. You know me. We get excited as we light the candles week on week, and it goes from one to four, and then that joyful moment when we finally light the white candle, and we finally sing that last verse of, O come all ye faithful. The Christmas decorations go up. Our attention in the church starts to turn towards the traditional Christmas services. Chris Dingle next week, carol service the week after, and the nativity in the morning. Carol's in the car park. All of the events that we just do by rote, the excitement continues to build and build and build until we get to that first communion of Christmas. But Advent starts in despair. Now that's a bit of a damper on New Year's Day, the liturgical New Year's Day. We're in despair. We're despondent. But it serves as a way of reminding us that we cannot get through life without God. It reminds us that whatever we are doing, we need God in the midst of everything. If we do our own thing, and leave God out of it, we're going to end up in despair and desolation. Now that will look different for each of us. For me, it was reaching the end of my tether with law and needing to step away and rediscover who I am. That was back in 2012. It's not been a direct journey. It's had lots of detours and difficulties on the way, and I'm still rediscovering who I truly am, who my true self is. It's part of the journey of discipleship. Perhaps there's some resonance for you as you look to discover your true self. As I was speaking to some people yesterday at the craft fair, it's obvious that there is a sense of despair in the world at the moment. There is a sense of despair in the church on a larger scale than I've ever encountered before. Yet despite the fact that everything looks lost, the church looks beaten, there are signs of hope. There are signs of hope within the Church of England. There is a real understanding at the depth of feelings that have been brought up over the last few weeks. There is a common thread running throughout the church that it cannot and must not get in the way of the gospel being preached. Particularly over Christmas time. It would be all too easy to spend all of our energy focusing on where do we sit, what do we view, Where's our th- what are our thoughts, but no. That's what the devil wants to happen. He wants us to focus on this divide that is occurring because it is taking our eyes off Jesus and it is taking our eyes away from preaching the gospel and telling the community out there the good news of Jesus Christ. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That is what we need to focus on. And if we lose sight of that as a church, there's no point even meeting. Go home. Pack up and go home. There is also a sense of renewed commitment to the Church of England in terms of the diocese and the bishops. There is a sense of openness and talking. And the bishops are starting to talk about being more transparent. They have heard what was said. They shouldn't do things in secret. Alleluia. Alleluia. We are in this together, friends. I'm still going to joyfully report to Bishop Allen. I might not necessarily agree with him, but I will joyfully report to him because he is my bishop and I have sworn canonical obedience to him. That's what being part of the Church of England is about. It's about living together with our difference and preaching the good news. If we look beneath the surface, though, if we look beyond the presenting circumstances, there is always hope. If we look beyond whatever it is we're facing, there is always hope. During the COVID pandemic, we looked down and out. It was all doom and gloom. Those daily reports from Downing Street where Chris Whitty was presenting a slide and the figures were going up and up and up and up. One million, two million, three million. Deaths were going up and up and up. It all looked like it was done. Would we ever get our freedom back? Yet through all of that, there was still hope in the background. Because there was work on a vaccine. There was talk of us getting more immune. 
There was chances where we could start meeting with people again, even if it was in a garden six foot apart. There was hope. So I want to say to you this morning, whatever circumstance you are facing in your life, good or bad, there is hope. There is hope in whatever circumstance you are facing, no matter how bad you might think it is, you might feel down and out and think you're really at the end of your tether. But friends, believe me, there is hope. Why? Look to the crib. Because Jesus comes to be amongst us, to live amongst us as God with us. The crib is empty at the moment, but it will be filled with the most wonderful gift that anybody can ever give in 20, my maths has gone out, over three weeks' time. I'm not good at maths. Brendan knows that. God is at work, friends. God is at work in the world. God is at work in the church. God is at work in me and in you. Isaiah 64 that we had this morning recounts the wonderful acts of God. And in three weeks, oh, there we go, I've written it down. Look, in three weeks, we will gather together and we will celebrate the incarnation. One of the most incredible gifts that humanity has ever received. God wanted to come down to earth and experience all that we go through. He wanted to know the range of human emotions. The ups, the downs of life, the challenges, the trials, the difficulties. But also the joy, the hope and the anticipation that we have too. These last few months, I've been really challenged by Hannah. The sense of joy and excitement that she gets when we suggest something is absolutely contagious. I was baking with the children on Friday to get ready for yesterday. I said to Hannah, Hannah, shall we bake a cake? And she sort of looked at me and went, yay! Over baking a cake. I think we need to rediscover some of that joy in our lives. The joy of a toddler. Let the little children come to me. We need to rediscover what joy is. I'm learning a lot about what it means to be a father to my children. And through that, I'm also starting to see how God as a father sees me and how he sees you. The, and the love that I have for my children is nothing, absolutely nothing, compared to the love that God has for me. God loves each and every one of us. That, friends, is where our Advent hope lies. That God loves us. There is a deep sense of desperation in an out-of-control situation. But there is always a bold and confident trust that God can intervene and bring peace and joy. For Isaiah, life without God is unbearable, but life with God can be completely transformed. That is the hope that we carry in the here and the now. That is the true Advent hope that we are reminded of, that with God, lives can and will be completely transformed. So what is it that feels out of control for you at the moment? Maybe it's something personal that's going on in your, own, in your life. Maybe it's something in the church. Maybe it's something in the world. There are lots of things that feel out of control. And this is subjective because it will be different to each and every one of us. So don't let anyone tell you, if you say, actually, I stubbed my toe that feels out of control, that is the be-all and end-all for that particular person. Through to the fact that there is war in Europe still. And many other things. But I want to ask you a simple question. That thing that, is out, that you feel is out of control in your life, in the church, in the world. When was the last time you took it to God? When was the last time you sat before our Lord and Savior and said, God, this feels out of control. Where's the hope? Where's the joy? What if you were to take that to God today as we begin this season together? 
What if you took it to God? Not as an afterthought. Of, oh, by the way, God, I've been dealing with this problem for the last however long, and I'm just coming to you now. Don't do it like that. But do it boldly and confidently, knowing that God can be trusted. Knowing that God will show you the signs of peace and joy that only he can bring. That's one of the reasons we've been doing Freedom in Christ. Bringing to mind those things that hold us back as disciples so that we can be free to be who God has made us to be. It's been a big part of our discipleship. It's a journey we've been on together. And I believe that the Lord is asking more of us in terms of discipleship. Since I started here, and I know it's been happening before too, the Lord has been saying we need to get to know our scripture better. I think that is a wider call to the church and the nation at the moment. Indeed, when I was meeting with the CEC on Wednesday and New Wine on Thursday, one of the bishops that joined us said, the problem is there is a lack of biblical literacy in this world. We need to get to know our scriptures better. To that end, next year as a church, we are going to embark on a journey of discipleship. There'll be more information coming out on that in due course. But the groundwork has been laid by the, the rule of life and freedom in Christ. And we are going to spend next year exploring Scripture together and getting to know our Scriptures better. Because that is what the Lord is asking of us in this time. I met with the wardens on Thursday evening. We got really excited as we started exploring and praying about how that might look within the church. The Lord has been speaking and we are listening. The church may look down and out, but there's a sign of hope. There's a sign of peace. There's a sign of joy. God's saying, you, okay, you want me to do stuff in your church? Read my word. Get to know my word. So going back to Advent hope and the passage from Isaiah. If we take a step back and look at it as a whole. In the first four verses, there is expectancy and an insistence for God to come. In verses 5 to 7, it explains why the intervention longed for has been prevented. In that context, it's Israel's failure to live in the covenant. Perhaps for us in 2023, the interventions that we've been praying for, whether it's a vote at General Synod, an end to war, or something else, is a sense of defeat because we have not lived up to the way that God has asked us to. I keep coming back to 2 Chronicles 7.14 on the screen, please, Emily. If my people will act, We'll pray, sorry. Then will I act. Perhaps there is more to this verse than meets the eye. I keep coming back to this verse, friends. It's not a case of when. It's a case of if my people pray, then I will hear. It's not if my people pray, I might. It's if my people pray, then Will I act? Somewhere in the mix of hope and failure, there's a place where faith waits for the coming of Jesus. We cry out for help, but our situation seems to block us. But in verse 8 of the passage, where we hear God called Father, there is a simple word, yet. Or it's literal translation from Hebrew, and now. It goes from all that is past to the here and the now. It mentions God as Father. It reminds the readers of the covenant that God has made with them. And Israel's deep trust in God is matched by God's covenant to Israel. There is a passionate plea in verse 9. Don't be angry. Don't hold it against us forever. Notice and remember that we are your people. We belong to you. You cannot disown us. We don't have any other source of help. So their prayer for help that begins so loudly in verse 1, where are you, God, ends up here with that feeling of intimacy with God as our Father, saying, look, Lord, we need you. We need you. Advent focuses on God's, not on that massive power of God, but on God's sense of family and solidarity together as brothers and sisters in Christ. So as we journey through Advent this year, my prayer is that we wouldn't despair at the state of things in the world and the church, but we would joyfully look at what is to come. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let's keep reading Scripture. 
Let's keep expecting to meet with God because as Paul tells us, he's able to do immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. So when you get home and open your envelope, if what you wrote has happened, be thankful. If what you wrote has been surpassed, be thankful. If what you wrote has not yet happened, be thankful because it's clearly not right time for you yet. All of what we do is in God's timing. And it's a good job we can't see around the next corner because we might not like what it reveals. God will only give us as much as we can cope with. Advent is a time of expectant waiting. Next slide, please, Emily. It is a time of waiting. The whole story of Advent is a story of how God can't be kept out because God is present. God is with us. God shows up. Not with a parade, but with the whimper of a baby. Not among the powerful, but among the marginalized. Not to the demanding, but to the humble. So will you journey this season of Advent in anticipation and hope that once again, we will meet that little baby boy, born in a drafty, cold stable. And once again, we will hear of the miracles he performed his obedience to the Father that will ultimately lead him to die and rise to new life. The hope we see in Bethlehem at Christmas is far more than Mary and Joseph could have ever asked or imagined. So where is your hope and anticipation today? Is it in the things of this world? Or is it in the Savior 